Hi folks, um, I think we can go ahead and get started. My name is Gunnar Knapp, I'm the director of ICER. I'd like to welcome all of you here for this talk. Um, and um, uh, I think what we'll do is if we could briefly just, uh, just go around the room and um, briefly give everybody a chance to sort of say who the people are so that we, we have a sense of who all is in the room and who we're talking to. Um, also, at the speaker's request, I've uh, handed around a sign-in sheet um, we're mainly just interested in, in learning who is here and if you could uh, just give your name and your organization and if you wish your email, um, that would be great. Um, and then after we've gone around the room, I'll have uh, Walker introduce our speaker and then, then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Gunnar Knapp. I am the director of ICER and I am an, econom am an economist. I've been with ICER actually for about 35 years. Uh, I'm Charles Judemol. I'm a public health data analyst with the Alaska Division of Public Health. I'm Jared Parrish. I'm an epidemiologist with the Alaska Division of Public Health. I'm Rebecca Robinson with the Department of Psychology, resilience researcher and trauma therapist. I'm Jan Rutherdale. I uh, re will retire from the Department of Law doing child protection, um, but I'm chair of the Children's Justice Act Task Force, which is meeting two floors down, so I heard about this. Okay, well, no. I'm Marnie Rivera from the Justice Act. Johnson, the director of Alaska Cares in the Children's Place, and here for the Children's Justice Act's first meeting as well. So we're crashing the first. Let's <laughs> 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 Gutabi, assistant professor of economics, specialization in regional economics. Uh, Jeff Bowman, I'm a professor of economics and economic theory, and I'm the director of the Alaska Cares in the Children's Place Task Force. I'm Alexi Bell, I'm a researcher here at ICER. I'm Corey Whitmore, I'm a program evaluator for the Foundation. I'm Peter McClung, an economist with Delver. Oh, I'm a researcher, ICER researcher. You're welcome, Mark William, I'm Peter McClung, here at ICER. Susan Mayer, Health Planning and Systems Development Division of Public Health. I'm Tracy Grimmel, I work for Rural County Health Planning and Charles Torres, Alaska Children's Trust. Isabella Marmino, a continuing psychology student, and Trevor Spitzer. Suzanne Sharp, ICER researcher. I don't know. 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 Um, thank you all for coming. This is a house full of good gathering. Um, we have a very important topic to talk about. Um, adverse childhood experiences. Many of you might have heard about it. Many of you might know a lot about it. Uh, but Pat Sidmore has been talking about it for a while now. And uh, he started collecting data two years ago in Alaska. 2013. 2013. Yeah. So this is second year. Yeah. This is second year as part of the Burfus survey that we have. Um, and the data is coming out just now, and Pat and everybody else involved with uh, ACES is interested in getting some research um, lens on the data. And there are lots of folks here that can connect their work with ACES, um, and I can too. That's my interest. That's why I invited Pat to come and present. And um, we are going to, you, many of you may have heard Pat talk before. Um, if you did, I asked him to focus more on the potential research questions that we can try to answer using the data that we have now. Um, at this childhood experiences, he'll explain a little bit more of, about what that is. So um, I Thank will you. leave you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Well, I'm happy um, happy to be here. I have been talking quite a lot about this lately, so um, this was this is going to be a little different uh, format for me. Um, I think um, well, there's a couple things. The t to start with, I, I left a notebook um, that we'll leave here at Iser. It has the um, it has the Burfus questions, the about 140 questions that were asked in 2013. It has the script. Um, it also has uh, a couple of short reports that the CDC has put out on ACE BRFUS data. Uh, BRFUS is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. It's a phone survey that's done every year, ongoing. Um, 
And it also has Washington State's complete report on their ACE study using the Burfus and a bibliography as well. Uh, it's certainly not a complete bibliography, but it'll get you down the road if you if you want to look at it. So I'll just leave that here. My cards are stuck in there if you have questions. I'll also uh, pass this around for people to go into that screen. So um, j just to start, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, when, when the ACE study came out almost 20 years ago now, um, they, they weren't really thinking much about the, the mechanisms um, as, they've got, as they got the first data back, which showed that adverse childhood experiences led to all sorts of health outcomes that were poor for adults. Um, but it, it really is about the brain, and uh, subsequent research has, has shown that the uh, the ACE researchers and, and neurobiologists have got together, gotten together, and um, there are exciting things coming out about it almost every month. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is, as you see this data and think about it is that human development starts um, from the bottom up. And so, you know, if you think about I've seen a couple little ones around here today. Um, those those first few months are really about kind of, you know, sleeping, getting control of arms and legs, and slowly it moves into more emotional things, and finally to abstract thought, to being able to control your emotions and make good decisions, and, and that, that is a process. And what happens when children are traumatized is they get stuck in, in these emotions and in this part of the brain because the, the other parts haven't had a chance to develop because they're in a constant state of trauma. And so um, it, it's just kind of a preface to keep in mind. So adverse childhood experiences from the, from the ACE study that the CDC and um, Kaiser Permanente did, they looked at 10 uh, different adverse childhood experiences. This is the list. Um, for the purposes of, of the Alaska data that we'll talk about today, uh, when the CDC developed their questionnaire for the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System survey, they dropped neglect. They didn't add that in. Um, we finally, after the first year, when we asked just the first eight questions, somebody called me and said, why didn't you include neglect? I said, the CDC didn't include neglect. And anyway, so subsequent years, this year and next, we are including neglect. Um, but so these are these are the items that uh, that were asked about of of each individual in the original ACE study. It was primarily middle class white people in San Diego who had health insurance because they were in the Kaiser Permanente plan. Um, and we'll look at some of those results first before we get into the Alaska specific data. So. Uh, these are the questions that we ask. You know, I'm going to just flip over those. So, what the what the uh, what the researchers found was that there was so much overlap. If you had one ACE, you were very likely to have another adverse childhood experience. Um, we'll see later in the data that if you have if you experienced watching domestic violence as a child in Alaska, there's a 55% of those people also experienced physical abuse. And you'll see this, this overlap of ACEs over and over. So what the researchers did was they developed an ACE score. And for each category of ACE, um, you got one, for example. So if you <laughs> reported physical abuse, you had one. If you reported physical abuse 38 times in your childhood, you got an ACE score of one, OK? It's each category up to a, uh, up to a, a total of, of 10 in the original study and eight in what we're going to look at today for Alaska. So these are uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Andes' slides. Uh, he was one of the original researchers from the CDC. And this is what we see over and over in the ACE research. And epidemiologists tell me that you get a, you get a graph like this and it's your career. Is that pretty much true? Kind of. Kind of, OK. So what they found was that uh, the more the more dose of adverse childhood experiences someone had, the more likely in this case they were to be a, a victim of, of domestic violence. As an adult. 
as an adult. So they're reporting on their childhood, and then as an adult, this is, this is what it looks like in terms of, of being a victim of, of domestic violence. Um, I work for the Mental Health Board and the Advisory Board on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, so this one is especially important for us. Um, same sort of thing, that same stair step. Um, ever had a problem, a drug <coughs> problem? You know, you're up, what is it, maybe 10 times more likely if you have five or more ACEs to have ever had a drug problem than if you had no adverse childhood experiences. Injecting drugs, if you have no ACEs, there's almost no chance you will have ever injected drugs. Reminds me, um, uh, a colleague was telling me about running a group for uh, substance abuse uh, for women, and there were, I don't know, a dozen women or so, and they all had been sexually abused as children. So he was wondering, am I running a, a substance abuse group or a, uh, a group for, for people who have been sexually abused? And, and more and more we see in, in behavioral health that trauma is, is, a, is a big component. Uh, for our friends at, at public health who are looking at, uh, at, at teen sexual behaviors, um, same sort of stair step. This one's interesting to me. This is teen paternity. These weren't necessarily uh, teen fathers, but they were the, the mothers of these men were, uh, were teenagers. Same sort of stair step. So this is the model that they, they developed. Uh, the, the way to, to think about it. Childhood experiences lead to some sort of social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Adoption of health risk behaviors, maybe it's smoking, um, drinking, some other drugs or something like that, <laughs> leads to disease and disability and early death. People with high ACE scores can, can die as much as 20, 20 years earlier than their peers without. So, as I said, in the beginning, they really didn't know what the mechanisms were here. And we'll get back to that. But, um, so, I, I just wanted, because I can show you one slide after another of Dr. Andes that show the stair steps. And, you know, after a certain point, it's, uh, everybody glazes over. Um, but these are the, the 42 topics cited in Healthy People 2020, which is a public health document nationwide. And these are the areas of focus, and the ones in red are the ones that have been linked in peer-reviewed articles to ACEs. Um, heart disease and stroke, chronic back conditions. Uh, we think we, we've got uh, the University of Notre Dame looking at some of this data because we think some memory loss and dementia uh, may be linked um, with adverse childhood experiences just from some initial looks at, at what we got. In but the it, it's probably, it's and, probably uh, So, good. So it, it's, pretty, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty broad. That there are a number of things up here that, that have been studied, such as work absenteeism. Uh, and financial difficulties that are also linked with ACEs, and we'll see some of that in the Alaska data. So this brain research, this is the mechanism that 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 they think is is leading to the poor adult outcomes. This is kind of a famous uh, um, slide I'm not sure that came out when the um, when the kids started coming out of the orphanages in Romania. And the, the brain on the, on the left is a normal brain, and the brain on the right is, is the, that of a, a child who was raised really with a lot of neglect. And the brain, the brain structure itself is just not, not the same. Excuse me, this is um, Jolene on the teleconference. I don't know if you can not. Hello? Is someone on the phone talking? Yes, I'm calling. I'm talking because whoever's on the cell phone on your line is coming up just as clear as the presenter's voice. That's great. 
Yes. Somebody who's connected remotely to the presentation has uh, have their cell phone on and they're talking. So can you please mute your um, mute your phone there? Thank you. So I, I, I do want to point out a point in the uh, direction of, of James Heckman, who's an economist at, at Chicago, um, University of Chicago. He's got a Nobel. And he's uh, looked at this issue of, of early childhood intervention, uh, especially around um, uh, preschool. And, you know, what, what he's found is that, you know, those that kids that really get solid uh, care before they get to school end up with uh, they're more likely to graduate high school they're more likely to be employed um, and so when when kids are that age and they're snoozing or not they're uh, that's that's when we really got to got to do our strong work real quickly what's what's the boundary for early early is prenatal no but early child experience so these ed, ed, what Thanks. What is this up to? 18. Yeah. This is um, this is uh, Heckman's chart of of the payoff, uh, the rate of return for uh, on human capital, the uh, the line that shows um, where it's cost effective is pretty much right here. It uh, anything above is cost effective. So by, by the time we hit second grade. Then we start to, according to him, start to have more costs. So the BRFAS is a behavioral risk factor surveillance system. We survey, what, about 4,000 people, Charles? Uh, in, in each of two surveys. It, okay. Um, and uh, it's a phone survey. It uh, samples both landlines and cell lines. It, um, when, when, when the results come back, they're weighted to reflect the state. I know that uh, uh, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium uh, funds some extra uh, rural um, surveying so that we, we make sure we have enough uh, in the rural areas. But then again, it's all weighted at the end. So uh, Alaska became the 20th state to, uh, to conduct this survey using the same tool in 2013 and uh, again in 2014 and 15 we will so we're going to compare uh to some of the other states that have done this and just so you know there isn't a national rate for adverse childhood experiences it is uh, uh no one has done that work and so what we're going to use is the best thing that we've got which is a five state study that the centers for disease control put out uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Tennessee, and Washington. So they combine those states together and we'll compare our results to them just to try to give a little context. So we're going to look at one of the adverse childhood experiences here. This is the question uh, that, that is on the survey. Before age 18, how often did a parent or adult in, in your home ever hit, beat, kick, or physically hurt you? Once, more than once, or never? And if they answer once or more than once, that's an adverse childhood experience. That's one. These are the results from Alaska um, by gender. So what is that? About uh, 16, 17% of males reported being physically abused. And what, a little over 21% of females reported being abused prior to their 18th birthday. Yeah. Once or more than once, yes, score of one. It does. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you have 15 times the same experience. No, it's it's a definite weakness in the study, and and of course because developmentally we know that things work from the ground up, it doesn't uh, put any extra weight to someone being abused at three as opposed to 14, uh, which can have very different different outcomes. These are the, the results compared to those five states, an average of those five states. So, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, males in Alaska, 17% reported uh, physical abuse. In the five states, it was 14. Females, 
21 percent 15 in the five states statistically significant if you look just at overlap of confidence intervals between the two and then total 19 and about 15 percent so we're higher in this um age groups this was a surprising uh result for me um we see in our 18 to 24 year olds it's not statistically significant our sample size is still a little small in that case we're you know with the next two years we'll we'll really be able to flesh this all out and, and make some stronger determinations but but they were statistically similar in these two youngest age groups when compared to the other five states and but in the older three categories were higher um, and we see see this this is a general pattern among the individual adverse childhood experiences which I don't know about you but that that surprised me when I when I looked at it quick definition yes. of an Alaskan um, so if I'm 45 to 54 and I had an adverse child effect I may not have had that adverse child effect in Alaska correct okay. right yeah these are Alaskan residents when they're asked yeah so so we may be dealing with issues of in migration or out migration um, but one of the one of the reasons why I, um, why we wanted to compare to the other states is because we know that especially with people with high adverse childhood experiences we start losing them even as adolescents through suicide and other things so you tend to see uh, you often see these lower rates in the older ages and we don't know whether that's because the rates of physical abuse were lower then or many of those people have died off yeah you had a question well one thing that strikes me is that I mean, the older people back then getting spankings I mean that was considered normal and probably people would define that as physical abuse so it could be a combination of that and then also education outreach within you know the past 20 years saying you know this is no longer socially ex acceptable right and 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 those changing um, mores or practices or what's acceptable that's uh, again that's why we wanted to compare to the five states to compare generationally yeah Trevor in the study they actually defined what physical abuse was to not just ask whereas with the purpose they don't give a definition they just ask that question and you responded is that not correct yeah, yeah that question that I had up there is what they asked right but in the ACEs study they would ask specifically they would define what physical abuse was the the the, the questions here are pretty much based on what what were asked with the ACEs questions too yeah okay. so we can go back and you know what I I, di I didn't add into this one is that it, it specifically says don't include spanking but but I think but but what that means to different generations clearly is 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 a valid Thing to think about it. So, was there a question I asked about their residence when they were 18 or younger? Yes. So you can separate them out. Uh, uh, you can separate the, those numbers out from the so, sample. So these 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 in, these like Gunnar was asking these include those folks who were growing up elsewhere and moved here and at the time of the survey they're here. Right. But was there a question asked about where they were? When no. They were I'm sorry. No. Younger? No. Okay, so we can't really separate yeah. that out. Anything else about that? Okay. So these are the individual percentages for each of the um, adverse experience questions. And um, and instead of doing the average, we've got just the, the individual states. I'll let you kind of look at that and let it sink in for a sec. Anything jump out at you as, as surprising? Washington State. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Where 
I would say my quick summary is we're almost the highest in every category except that in some Washington and Alaska are very similar. I would agree. I would agree. And you think given poverty rates in New Mexico, Louisiana, that yes, Mm-hmm. This one jumps out at me too. Incarcerated family member. Mm -hmm. Really very high. Okay. So uh, again, using just the overlap of confidence intervals, this is the ones in red. Um, that this is Alaska as a percentage of the five state average for each individual adverse experience. So our, our rate is 160% of the five state average for incarcerated family members. And if they're red, they, they were statistically significant using the overlap and otherwise not. Yeah, just interestingly enough, it, it could be because we're, we're there's sort of this is showing how many adults have this how many Alaska current Alaska adults have had this experience in their in their, um, in their background. Mm -hmm. But if we want if we wanted to know sort of what's the prevalence what's been the prevalence of these kind of incidents in Alaska, it could be that that either that it was worse. Than, than implied by this, and it's been diluted by people with less bad experiences coming in, or conceivably the other way. So, well, it, it, it could be. I mean, we could have a narrative that says that says we're doing better. You know, that yeah. that we're not. And and um, when you look at at, at at sexual abuse, which I didn't didn't put on it, it it shows lower rates now there's the question of you know is an 18 year old ready to report that on a survey um if they experienced it you know is, is that too soon but again comparing to other to the other states it seems like in that category we're doing we're doing well so it, yeah there's a lot of subtlety to it so these are our ace scores yeah go ahead um, how did you define family members? Because in Alaska, you have a lot of places where you have non-relatives and relatives living within the same household and large households. It's it's uh, it's in your household, so that's the that's the definition. Okay, so I mean that could be maybe one of the reasons. Why it's right. So these are these are the results again, Washington similar which is surprising to me here's how we do with the five state um, averages for a scores still a little context this five percent difference here um, if we were to to move to move ours up to the level zero aces which is a good thing if we were to move ours up to the level of the five states that'd be about 28,000 more adults with zero aces so just a little context okay so I'm going to start to get into yeah go ahead Yep. Yay, nay of answering these questions, yep. right? And we're attributing those statistics to the state, although we don't know where the, the respondent was living as, as a youth, right? Correct. Have we looked at the determinants of these adverse childhood experiences per state? I mean, in order to see whether the determinants are the same across the states. Because I mean, I, I feel like there is, we're conflating a lot of different things, right? And so and we're comparing the state outcomes without really understanding the underlying drivers. So I mean, the, the question is, what are the determin are the determinants different across the states of these responses? Um, the attributes. You mean the 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 outcomes? No, no. no. When, when when I say yes to uh, of being physically abused, 
that's arguably correlated with my attributes, with the, with the, the attributes of the place where I lived. When we look at the probability of saying yes to childhood abuse, are those determinants of me saying yes the same across the states? Because the states differ on Right, the right, right. No, no, I wouldn't think so. No. Yeah. So this is, uh, we're, we're going to start to look at some of the links between some of the other questions with with the adverse childhood experiences. So this is this is straight from the from the survey. Uh, on average, how many hours of sleep do you get in, tw in a 24 hour period? They give you the number, uh, it's entered in. And then in terms of calculating insufficient sleep or not, I think it's uh, eight or more if you're 18 or eight less than 18 and seven and a half or more is uh, if you're 18 plus is is sufficient this is how the CDC does it these are our results uh, zero aces so about half half of the people with four plus aces report that they they have under that that amount of sleep These are uh, one of the questions asked about their educational achievement. Uh, the ones in blue are um, not graduating from high school or getting a GED by ACE scores, and then in yellow, being a college graduate. So it's about five times, about five times more likely to graduate um, from college than not graduate from high school if you uh, have zero ACEs, and it's almost the same. If you have four plus. There's questions about uh, food. In the last 12 months, were you ever hungry but didn't eat because there wasn't enough food? Is, is, are the blue ones. 42% four plus said that that was true. So that would be about 35,000 adults, a little more maybe. In Alaska and then did you ever cut the size of your meals or skip a meal because you could not get enough food uh, using food assistance programs either community ones or uh, federal or state government programs uh, this is how it breaks out Alaska adults who report having current outstanding medical bills or a time when they couldn't afford to see a doctor. Same sort of stair step, although here it doesn't really yeah, jump yeah. jump until the four plus. Any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. um, when you look at income, the income is a similar sort of thing, so it's probably that. It kind of lines up. So here's a comparison of a number of different measures from the Burfus with zero aces and four aces in red. Uh, current smoker, uh, you can see it's a little bit more than double your chances of being a smoker. Uh, the high school education we just looked at, uh, people who reported unable to work two and a half, three times, fair or poor uh, physical health, Frequent mental distress. This is uh, distress in the last 30 days for 14 out of those 30 days that was somewhat debilitating. Depression, the sleep one we just looked at, and the food assistance. So this also has a, a couple of interesting uh, quirks in it that by looking at these, uh, at these, uh, age cohorts, we kind of get a little snapshot back into time because they're reporting on what occurred in their childhood or in their uh, under age 18. And we can see that in the 55 plus, that group is, is uh, reporting that in their household, if, they had a if there was a drug problem, that most of it was alcohol. Where as we jump to the most recent generation, it's, it's really a mix. Um, and this gets to uh, 
this gets to uh, our providers of behavioral health services. This is a this is a much more straightforward treatment system than than this. So they report on what type of insurance they have. This is a this is very similar to what Wisconsin did. Numbers are close. Uh, given the health outcomes of, of people with higher ACE scores, you know, our government programs are, are paying for more because they have higher ACEs than the, than the private sector health insurance. Okay, population attributable risk. This is not math that I did. <laughs> Charles and his crew did this for me. So they looked at those stair step approaches, and I understand that this is a in epidemiology kind of a kind of a standard sort of thing that, that that's done. And so the the gray blob in the middle represents the percentage of each one of these pies that can be tied back to adverse childhood experiences. The idea being that if you wave a magic wand, eliminate all adverse childhood experiences, 60% of frequent mental distress goes away. Um, so this is the one I wanted to know. Medicaid, if you think about it, Medicaid requires that you um, either be poor or have bad health or both in order to qualify. So this, this really makes sense given what we know about outcomes from ACEs. So we just did a little, little quick calculation. We went into the Department of Health and Social Services website. We looked at the, the cost from 2012 in their, in their Lewin report and comes out to about $860 million for adult Medicaid in 2012. If we apply that 40% to it, it's about $350 million that we think, given the previous chart, can be tied back to, to ACEs. And it's not that we're going to do away with all ACEs. We realize that. But it's a way to kind of quantify that. You can do this with smoking. If you look back, current smokers, 32% of our smoking problem. Um, related to adverse childhood experiences. Um, that's uh, our smoking problem is almost 600 million in Alaska estimated. So almost 200 million. So um, I was talking to the, the director of, of uh, juvenile justice this morning and and we were talking about this this slide, and uh, so what this shows these are roughly this this isn't the, all the weighted data, so these numbers are a little different from from what I showed you earlier, but roughly the same. The, in the diagonal, these are kind of the statewide averages of of, of these problems. So about 17% of physical abuse in, or in in the state people reported physical abuse. If they had sexual abuse present. 43% of those folks also reported physical abuse. That's how you read it. So domestic violence. So I think about a domestic violence shelter who, you know, their, their primary focus is to, is to protect the woman and usually a woman and get her safe. Um, and they often have children along. And when I ask about what sort of programming those kids get, it's pretty minimal. This is what our Alaskans say who, who've witnessed domestic violence, our adults say that they, you know, 55% of those who's, who witnessed domestic violence also suffered physical abuse. Sexual abuse, 30%, you know, substance abuse in the home, 69%. There's a lot of ACEs going, going on for those kids. So this is the kind of information we want to get to the courts and to those, to those folks running the shelters. <laughs> Yeah, the walker. You know, the Office of Children's Services reports the number of allegations. They collect um, allegations by type right. for every child that they deal right. with. 
and they can come up with uh, with the numbers that they have, we can come up with a similar table. It would be interesting to see. It would be. Look at comparison between that and this. It, it would be, and, and Charles and I ran some numbers because Washington State did something like similar to this, and we ran the numbers, and it's they're remarkably similar um, in in what they saw too. So there seems to be almost be a standard if you have this, you're likely to have that, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, there's not been enough research into it yet. Well, I mean, sorry, but yeah. digress just a little bit. If you think about the cumulative risk model, how it's an additive model, the whole purpose of it is to try to explain the heterogeneity that you see among these social risk factors that we have. And so it's really not shocking that we see this step increase because the more you have, the more of it that it's explaining the heterogeneity within that individual. And so these types of things are really expected. I, I would actually be shocked if I didn't see these types of things. What I was trying to get at by comparing is, did it change or is it any different from what it was for now adults, past kids, to what it is now for kids? Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, and, and we could even, this could even be done within the Burfus data itself to compare generationally how it, how it works out as well. I, I, I think, th I think the, the, the main point that I want to get at is that this is really a rich pool of uh, of information to explore, um, and um, I think that uh, I, I'm somewhat here trying to sell it to you. Pat, Pat yeah. On that previous slide, yeah. can you just clarify for me the difference between so, well, so like sexual abuse and physical abuse, what's the, the connection? So it's so, yeah. Which other different? The row, if looking on the row going across, right. and when you see when it's like sexual abuse versus sexual abuse, for putting something in the diagram, I put in the population. No, no, but I mean, so sexual abuse and physical abuse, it's 43.7%. Yes. In the rows, and it's 35.9. That's it. That's the pre if you have physical abuse, what is the prevalent? What's the uh, that you're going to have sexual abuse being co occurring? So, here's a way to think about it if, if, if you set up a ratio between these two and a, between these two and plug them in here, the numbers would be the same. Yeah, okay, yeah. I know I, I spent like a half a day <laughs> looking at that because again liberal arts major so. <laughs> so kind of what DeWalker was talking about you know this is just uh, just just from the OCS the Office of Children's Services website this is kind of the the average number of kids they have in in placement you know by month over the years um, it's pretty it's pretty steady I will say if you dig into it by age um, we're getting more and more younger kids pulled out of their homes. And that's, that's by definition, complex trauma. And um, it's a problem. The Division of Behavioral Health is asking not some, but not all of the ACE questions of everyone who goes through services through their grantees. Um, this, so I plugged in our kind of our rough ACE uh, adult data here is just as a reference. This is what the kids in behavioral health services are reporting. And remember, it's not a full list of ACEs, so it's underreported. Um, so 28% of, of the kids in behavioral health services have five or more ACEs already. So that's what our behavioral health system is dealing with. By the way, that's the, the richest untapped data source I can think of in the state. It's so hard to get a hold of them. They have about, include, because they ask adults, but it's lifetime for adults. Um, but even the kids, we're, we're talking thousands of, of, of people, of, of numbers. This, uh, because Dr. Rivera and I are looking at this in, in terms, somewhat in terms of the justice system and and this is from a, a recent report that the Mental Health Trust put out um, looking at recidivism rates 
for their beneficiaries in corrections and they were able to go back and look and see if they had child protection uh, records either as a parent or as a child and the overall with with no child protection record it was 28 percent and then you see with uh, a record as a child and as an as a parent the recidivism rates just so you know that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a survey this is from Washington State. This, the end for this is 125,000. They looked at records uh, of kids in their Medicaid system. And they, through administrative records, were able to determine some of the adverse childhood experiences. And they even added death of a parent and homelessness. Um, but through that, these are the odds ratios uh, of um, if, if those were present with ACEs and without ACEs, and uh, as to whether or not the kids were then in substance abuse treatment in the Medicaid system in their state, and of 125. So this is not a survey. This is all administrative records. I don't know if this would be possible here. This is the same thing uh, with mental illness or mental health treatment. I can't imagine crunching those numbers. So again, I was talking to the, the director of DJJ this morning, and we were looking at this slide. Um, this is clearly what, what they deal with uh, in, in terms of acuity in juvenile justice. They look at the number of referrals, which is basically the number of crimes. And this is the breakout for kids with one to three referrals, either with or without a behavioral health diagnosis. And then as we add four to six referrals, so more acute, you see the diagnosis uh, goes from 42 to 63, and we go to seven to 10, we're at 76, and 11 or more referrals, we're talking almost 90%. So uh, this is an issue most likely of, of trauma. Yes? Uh, we have less than 10 minutes. Okay. I'm wondering if um, you might want to... Yep, got one more slide, I think. So DeWalker wanted me to bring this up. And so one of the things that we've thought about in Washington State, who's done a, a lot of work with ACEs, is they've really gone through by county, we've gone through by census area, and looked at a, a, a number of measures, really plugged them in and see uh, this visual uh, way of looking at it to see you know, how ACEs are, are comparing with with other items. You can put in graduation rates or unemployment. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to really look at this geographically. And as our data gets richer uh, with subsequent years, uh, we'll, we'll be able to get mostly to the census areas. There are a few census areas we won't, but um, by three years, we'll really be able to, to know what's, what's happening in those communities. So discussion. Questions? Yes. What's your sample size, number of people interviewed in Alaska? It was this I believe was 4,000. And what's the, um, what, I don't know what's the term, uh, people who say, I don't want to talk to you. I mean, now that no, I mean, as of August, I stopped answering my We phone. have very good, the Castro yeah, uh, survey rates are very high. We are very fortunate. I think we're about 80% or more. So we do have very high participation, which is surprising. I mean, when uh, Florida is unable to obtain weighted data because of their very low response rate. So, uh, so you, you have reasonable comp as much as one can be with a phone survey that um, the numbers are yes yeah to break down between rural and urban areas we actually over samples are um we actually predominantly we have like our six public health regions but we try and do uh about at least five to 700 surveys in what I would call the, the real rural area. 
the north and the southwest portions of Alaska. So it would be in excess of, of that number. Have you done have you done the analysis by by uh, region or rural or rural versus non rural? We've done it by race. We've done a special analysis by uh, uh, Alaska data. Uh, there really isn't as much disparity as you would have, have imagined, as some people might have hypothesized. So you're saying so far in your in your race breakdown, just to understand that you found similar similar uh, similar results. Similar results. I'm just curious if any of the ICER researchers here know, or if anybody knows, I believe the, if you asked the question, if you interviewed Alaskans and said, uh, were you born in Alaska, you know, by age, what, when you get up to, you know, the 45, 50 and so on, it's about 30%. Yeah. Like 30%. We're born in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying 60% of the people in those older groups are from somewhere else. Well, I think the one thing I like about the, the purpose survey is that it's giving us an indication of the burden that we have in our state of people who are affected by ACEs. And if we look at the literature that shows the association with health, is, health outcomes, we're going to have to be responsible for those outcomes in our state. Mm -hmm. So th while I think it's very interesting to know the, the incidence or the, the prevalence of the, uh, the occurrence, it's really the burden of it is also what we're dealing with and what pe people in our population are going to be dying from and things like that. So. Um, I think the research questions that come from the, the Burpus survey um, could be directed that way more so as opposed to the incidents, but they're, they're important for us to consider as well. Then since that, that's interesting, let me throw the question back at you. And, and for the researchers who've worked with this, you're saying if these things happened to you 40 years ago, you, you're now likely to face this burden. Um, How does knowing that, and, and you mentioned the incident of the group where you, the people, see, so you were saying you were sort of unaware, you couldn't tell. Is this a group of people with a, um, mm -hmm. a problem of a substance, of current substance abuse, or is there a problem of uh, a uh, uh, severe adverse childhood experience? Mm -hmm. But but if 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 you know this, what's what's it imply for treatment or? Because it's sort of a little, I mean, we can work on the adverse, we can try to affect the adverse childhood experiences that children now are occurring, but what does it do for people that are adults? So, so there's an incredible amount of research, brain research, and, and, and other um, research in, in, in social work and psychology. Um, and one of the, the buzzwords is, is, is being trauma informed. And so, so recognizing that uh, an adult who has been raised in that sort of toxic environment is going to go quickly into that lower part of their brain um, for police officers, for people at public assistance who are dealing with them on the phone, um, uh, across our systems. What we find is that if, if people aren't trained in how to de-escalate situations, they will re-traumatize the person. And it, 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 it's the same things that happens in schools. You know, if, I, if I'm a kid that gets hit at home and somebody brushes against me, um, I'm going to react in a way that is probably going to get me in trouble. But if the, the school um, understands that, that my reaction is based on, on something other than um, me just being a bad kid, um, you're, we're seeing results in, in, in school systems down south. They're seeing results in, in DJJ already. Um, they, they've in, trained their entire staff now in trauma-informed care. Um, and and, and what, what people are finding is that you don't get those reactions. 
and and therefore you're 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 saving money, you're saving time, and you're um, and you're not re-traumatizing people, which perpetuates it. It also work, <clears throat> works on the other side for the staff. You see greater retention. Right. Most of the staff that are working in these industries are on that chart as well. So they traumatize. That person acts out, triggers me, traumatized that whole process. So it actually works on both ends. And they're just seeing people enjoying their jobs more, less stress, uh, the retention is there. It, it's phenomenal. So you know, it seems sorry, go ahead. It seems significant when you're talking about trauma and informed practitioners to have um, physicians, nurse practitioners, public health nurses involved. When I think about you know the domestic violence work that's been done that now they're screening questions on physical exams you know so because that's one of the you know, mm -hmm. few places of intervention sometimes for domestic violence but also with this when if you're looking at the direct correlation with health outcomes but post-traumatic stress isn't dealt with or isn't part of a treatment plan then you're not going to get you know the results so i'm curious what kind of screening programs, you know, education is being done with health providers? So the All Alaska Pediatric Partnership is is well on board. They've been a partner in 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 this. The the Children's Trust has is training people or has has trained people to go around and speak about this topic around the state. Um, I, I'm leaving this meeting to go and, and meet with the folks at the Child Trauma Center who run what's called Trauma 101 trainings around the state for all sorts of healthcare providers that includes this information and how they can uh, intercede with people and, and in a positive way. So it seems like then the next steps are how to get it into screening, you know, um, and then how does that screening then connect to treatment plans. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and Bill, up as to take out, like, I know Neighborhood Health Center, they've started within one of their programs actually asking ACEs questions mm -hmm. to help identify. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that Anda will always talk about is just because you have four ACEs doesn't mean you're going to be drug addicted. Yeah. There's resiliency and so forth. And that's probably one of the biggest pieces that is missing within the whole study is. And it's probably one of the strongest things you hear from the Alaska Natives when we talk about this data, whether the national or now or local data, is why do we keep talking about the bad, where's the positive, and actually finding what is the resiliency, because we're going to get rid of trauma. It's part of the circle of life, but it's resiliency that glues it together. And we're starting to have discussions around that resiliency piece. So we have to be careful with assessment that assessment isn't only just on the bad, but also what are your strengths. And if we take that, think about that on an economic level, that's the next area. We really want to see this. This isn't about just physicians assessing. Think about HR departments and how they design policies. How many of them design policies around supporting families attending um, teacher-parent interviews? They get so more excited about their Christmas party than supporting families having them look at their, their policy procedures, state policy procedures, the Medicaid program. You know, so it's greater than just that assessment, but looking at that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think what, I go ahead. Yeah. I think that you know, you're right, and resiliency is a whole other area and, and continuum. And, but I, what I'm just thinking about is in terms of the assessment of people who are presenting um, with health issues to health providers mm -hmm. and to have the ACEs be integrated so that for those for whom ACEs has had an impact on their health, mm -hmm. that addressing that through some of the post-traumatic stress methods then becomes part of the treatment plan that makes for, you know, for better health. Yeah, That's there was a the clinic in uh, <clears throat> San Francisco that worked with you and they really integrated this. They haven't asked the ACEs questions. What they've done is created a true assessment tool that they, one, understand what is the history of the child, uh, and then use that. Because one of the biggest concerns is people then get labeled as like, oh, you're a four, you're a five, you know, that concept. And, and that's what will happen over time. You look at diagnosis and mental health that happens. So they really were very conscious of it. And it's very cool how they're utilizing this information in 
surprise, surprise, and really the, our uh, South Central Foundation gets close to it, is they really tailor the services their history and make individualized services versus finding that cookie cutter. And hold and behold, these kids, you're seeing the resiliency grow, less dependency, less cost, all of that. So it's pretty phenomenal. So when I when I look at this, so insufficient sleep and what is it, forty five percent um of people with four plus aces don't get uh enough sleep, but what about this fifty five percent? They get enough sleep. What, what's going on? I, mean, I, I think that's the other piece that actually is in this data as well. We could actually look and see for those people with high A scores who aren't coming out with, a, with a, the, uh, the, the poorer outcomes. What, is, is there something we can determine from that? So, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Somebody had something. I'm part of the Farm West South Central Foundation. And so one of the things I was wanting to share is that one of our current funders, Jeff Hayes, is grant around trauma-informed care is helping shape all of the behavioral service intervention treatment groups and treatment options that's happening right now. So that's one thing, that was one way that this data is helping garner um, interest and support in changing actual practice. And I also want to mention that this ACES data was key in the ACA funding that was devoted to home visiting programs. So Alaska is one of many states that has home visiting for, and it's basically prenatal to age five, and you can pick a different program. So there's a Providence administered nurse family partnership program here in Anchorage, and then there is a South Central Foundation administered tribal home visiting program. And each of these programs enroll pregnant women before 28 weeks prenatally, and then stay with the families until the children are two, with the idea that if you can buffer um, children's and families' early experiences, you can prevent these ACEs and improve health. So it's being looked at in lots of different ways in Alaska, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that fits. These data also helped get a $9 million education grant mm -hmm. that uh, is focused on, uh, uh, on behavioral health in schools as well. So with all the positive things that we just mentioned about this data, we also noted several limitations at the beginning of your presentation, and there are probably several more. Um, do you have any thoughts you might want to share on how or what's the plan to improve the collection and utilization of the data that you have? Well, clearly, in, in terms of, uh, of changing the purpose, because it's come, it comes out of the CDC, we're, we're somewhat limited in what we can do there. Um, I think that in, in terms of uh, analysis, I know that public health um, is is really it's it's kind of a strange Charles and Rebecca Topol who hopefully is online who runs the Burfus program, um, you know have been incredibly responsive to me when I've asked for for data um, and I know that they will send out the the data for researchers with a you know a fairly simple research agreement. Um, we don't have the resources necessarily in the government to, I think, dig into this in, in the full sense that it could be. But I, I think um, for students or researchers who have a specific interest, it might be worth thinking about and taking a look at and to see how it could be meshed with other, other items and, uh, to, to really drive policy. I, I, um, and, and, you know, and the staff is, is very helpful uh, uh, answering questions about the data and, and the booklet there should should go a ways to answering some of those questions too. Again, also, and the limitation of the data collection itself, we're also creating a longitudinal prospective cohort study using a 2009 birth cohort through the PRAM survey. And we're using administrative data linkages to get at some of these ACEs as well as a bunch of other information as well. And that should be available for uh, mining, data mining by researchers by next year. And, and that's going to be followed indefinitely. So to get at some of these other questions. Uh, we're starting with the 2009 birth cohort, so that's like 1,200 mothers. And then um, after we get the success of the linkages, we'll bring in 2010 and possibly 2011. So we'll have probably like 3,800. So this is PRAMS, so it only follows the mothers, not the kids. But so it samples, it, it does a pretty good job of being close to sampling the bird population, but it's mothers of newborns, and so basically it excludes like if you have a twin bird, things like that. And so there are some exclusion criteria on it. 
but it does pretty good at uh, representing birth cohort as well. And they said the sampling unit is the mother, right? Sampling unit is the mother of a newborn based on parameters, right? right. So, but it's based on the child birth. Oh. Okay. So this. Okay. Yeah, the sampling unit on prams is a little. It's not as clear as we'd like it to be, but that's why they always say mothers of newborns. So, but the cohort is actually the mothers, not the kids. So you don't follow the kids along the way. But I'm going to be following the kids. Okay, that's my question. Yeah, and the moms and their husbands and their histories and so. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, this isn't my field. So this is all new and news to me about these dramatic correlations. I'm just curious, um, within the within the communities of people that are, are sort of um, the, the healthcare community, uh, to what extent is this is this linkage understood and recognized and widely publicized? Are you at the stage where everybody sort of knows this, or people yeah. are just learning? No, I mean I, I, I've been training about ACEs better than 15 years, and, and I'm still shocked by the number of healthcare providers when I do a presentation and say they have never heard of ACEs. So I, you know, for me, ACEs is probably one of the most important pieces of public health research that's come out in the last 20 years that nobody's ever heard of. So it, it, it's like everybody else in the state of Alaska seems to be becoming more informed about ACEs except healthcare providers. So. We keep trudging along, providing, and, and um, A2P2 has, you know, done a really good job trying to provide education. I've on my on my platform anytime I have a chance, but um, it's it's a challenge to get the information. And, and we're hoping by having these this Alaska specific information that that will help to generate. That's really why we went after it. Um, Is there some report out that? says the stuff that sort of summarizes the stuff? It, we're, we're hoping for uh, the health summit at the end of January to have that all. And there'll be a website going live, too. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.